But um, this morning, the first session I am going to uh, chat to us about for a short while is I want to talk to you about this whole issue of how do we answer tough questions. Because as I shared last night, one of the things I think that holds many of us back, many Christians back from being more confident in talking about their faith at work, uh, with their friends, with their neighbors, with their family, uh, is this fear of what happens if I'm asked a question I can't answer. What happens to my friends is, okay, you're a Christian, what about? And we have nothing to say to the, to the what about. And so what I want to do this morning is teach you a series of, of steps, a little process that you can go through no matter what the question. Because learning specific answers to specific questions is wonderful, um, but firstly, many of us don't have a brain that size. I forget things uh, that I hear in, in talks very quickly or things that I've read. And also, of course, no matter how wise you are, no, no matter how many books you've read, what happens if you come across a skeptical friend who asks a question you've never heard of? And uh, so that's what we're going to think about this morning. But let's begin by noting that when it comes to questions, uh, the church has not always had uh, the best of reputations when it comes to engaging with questions and challenges uh, to our faith. A few years ago, uh, I was speaking at a university event, uh, an event in Canada, uh, down in the university district in Toronto. Uh, we had lots of university students there, lots of skeptics. It was a brilliant night, a uh, real good opportunity to engage uh, with, with atheism and to hopefully share some, uh, some wisdom and some reasons why I thought the Christian faith was, uh, was compelling. And we had a large audience, many non-Christians there, brilliant evening. But after the event, there was a, uh, there was a little reception. And, uh, and over the snacks uh, afterwards, I got talking to a student. And the student came up to me, and uh, as we were chatting, he said to me, do you know, Andy, he said, thank you for tonight's presentation, very interesting. He said, but do you know, I used to be a Christian, but I'm not any longer. Now, I don't know if you've ever had those kind of conversations. Uh, whenever I hear that, it, it sands me, but I've learned always to be gentle, to try and find out the story. So I said to him, sorry to hear that. Tell me your story, what, what happened? He said, well, what happened, Andy? He said, I was raised in a, in a very fundamentalist church, his words. He said, raised in a very fundamentalist church where really no, no questions were, were, were really encouraged. We were told just to believe and, and get on with it. And he said, but um, I discovered a love for the sciences as I, as I grew up. And so uh, when I got to 18, 19, I applied to come and study biology here at the University of Toronto, was accepted, came, and I loved it. He said, but within a few weeks of studying here uh, on the biology course at, at University of Toronto, I was being dis discovering things, being taught things that didn't fit with the way my church had taught me, taught me about origins. I was coming up with contradictions between the science I was being taught and my understanding of the book of Genesis. So he said, I thought what I would do, I would book an appointment with my pastor to chat this through with him. I said, brilliant. I said, what a great idea. I, presumably your, your pastor introduced you to some of the many resources written by Christians in the sciences to help you think about those questions. He said, no. I said, oh, what did your pastor say? He said, well, my pastor simply looked at me and said, well, it's really simple, son. You choose the Bible or choose biology. Next question. I said, what did you do? He said, I chose biology. And I confess, you know, that broke my heart, really, because although as that conversation went on, I was able to share two or three resources written by Christians in the sciences um, that really show how there is no contradiction between, between science and, and faith, it almost felt like it was not quite too late, it never is for the Lord, but incredible damage had been, had been done because of that young man's clueless pastor had not taken the time to listen and not taken the time to, to answer carefully. That young man had walked away with the impression that you could not be a Christian and a scientist. If he had listened, if he'd asked better questions, if he'd taken that young man, man seriously, it might have been very different. And that lesson, I think, just teaches us, that story teaches us that as we speak with our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues, as we speak with perhaps the young people in our lives, you know, if they have questions or objections, we need to take those seriously. We need to address them, we need to listen to them, we need to engage with them, and we need to do that well. And in a moment, I'm going to teach you five steps that you can go through, no matter what the question that will help you engage with, with anybody, whether it's a question you've heard a thousand times 
although it's a question you've heard for the first time. But before that, I just think it's worth sharing with you some principles that it's worth keeping in mind when we're engaging with people's questions. Three principles that I think it's useful to keep front and center when we are talking with those uh, who have no, no faith. And then we'll get into some more detail. So the first thing I think is very helpful is remember that your aim is ultimately not to answer the question, but to answer the questioner. You know, we're not trying to engage in intellectual games, we're trying to engage with the person. Uh, and so just be conscious of that. It can be helpful to realize too that sometimes the question that you're asked is not the real question. Sometimes there are deeper issues, uh, issues going on. I remember teaching a, a, gr- a class uh, a few years ago, similar to, to last night's material, to a, to a youth group, to a group of teenagers. And I got this amazing email from the youth leader who'd organized it a couple of days later. He explained how one of, his, uh, one of the kids who'd been in that class the next day was in, was in school and was in a science lesson. And one of his fellow students had sort of called out to him, oh, what are you doing in a science lab? You're a Christian. Christians don't believe in science. And he said this uh, teenager, because he'd been in the seminar and had learnt those three questions, rather than panic or go off in a random direction, had simply looked at his classmate and said, that's really interesting, what do you mean by that? That had opened up a conversation in which it turned out this other kid in the class had just lost a beloved grandparent's cancer, was furious at God, and was simply looking for a Christian to, to lash out at. Nothing to do with science, and the conversation that ensued was about a totally different question to the one that had been asked. Our aim is to answer the questioner, not the question. Just bear that in mind. Secondly, and related, remember to clarify a question. If somebody raises an objection, if somebody says, okay, you're a Christian, what about... Those questions I taught you last night can just slow the conversation down a little bit. You can use those what questions and those why questions to find out a bit more about where your friend is coming from. Do you know, over the years, uh, I've learned that actually when someone asks me a question or raises an objection to Christianity, a great question to use in terms of developing the conversation is simply to look at the person who's asked you the question and say, what a fantastic question. Tell me, why do you ask it? Sometimes that why have you asked that question will get you the story, it will get you a bit more of the person you're dealing with, and then again, that will help you address the questioner, not just the question. And then thirdly, be willing to admit your limitations. You know, if a friend has asked you a question that you don't know the answer to, you might have a few ideas, but you don't know the answer to, don't just muddle your way through it. Be willing to say, look, I, that's a great question. Um, I can offer one or two thoughts, um, but I don't know the specifics. You know, leave that with me. I will try and find you the answer and get back to you. The one exception to this uh, where we can sometimes go wrong is if the question your friend has asked you is a question that every Christian should have thought about, saying, I have, don't really know the answer to that, cannot look like wisdom, it can look like lunacy. Let me give you an example. If someone comes up to you and says, you know, how on earth can you believe in God with all the suffering in the world? If you respond, do you know what an amazing question? That's never occurred to me before. I wonder. That doesn't make you look wise. It just makes you look completely detached from reality. Um, So just be careful to be aware that as Christians living in this complicated, broken world we find ourselves in, we do need to be people who've thought a a little about our faith. As 1 Peter 3 verse 15 says in the New Testament, always be willing to give a reason for anyone who asks you to explain the reason for the hope that you have. We need to be willing to do that as, a, as God's people. So with those basic principles in place, how do we respond to somebody who has a question or an objection? Maybe it's one we've heard before, maybe it's one we haven't heard before. Well, I think there are five, <laughs> excuse me, I think there are five steps Uh, that we can go through in any conversation. And to make them super easy to remember, I have given you an acronym. I was born and raised in a Baptist home, so I love sermons where every point begins with the same letter, or if you can't do that, an acronym. And by the way, you don't have to be a Baptist to go to heaven, but why take chances? That's my motto. I picked on Presbyterians last night. By the end of the afternoon, at the end of the day, I will have made jokes about every denomination. I'm an equal opportunity offender. Right. SHARE is the acronym that I use for the five steps. So let me uh, walk you through this, and then we will take a couple of example questions 
and share how you might use this. So how does the share acronym work? Well, the first thing when you get asked a question, step one is to sympathize. When somebody asks you uh, a question or raises an objection, look for a way to make a connection. Affirm the questioner. For example, you might say, do you know, I, I used to have that question uh, when I was younger. Um, or you might want to say, do you know, that's a great question that you've asked there. I've, I've thought a bit about that over the years. Or simply saying, what a great question. Thank you for, for asking it. Something that makes that personal connection to the person who's asking you the question can be tremendously helpful. So step one, sympathize. Step two is to look for the hidden assumptions. Just like uh, you know, an iceberg in a shipping lane where the, the top of the iceberg is the tiny bit uh, above the water where there's much more below the water, similar with many questions, there is stuff kind of lurking below the waterline. There are assumptions that your friend has made in asking the question that they may not have identified. And it can be very helpful when someone asks you a question to bring some of the assumptions that they are making out into the open. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Uh, the next step, A, is for apply the Bible. As we address our friend's question uh, and engage with what they've asked us, we want to gently invite our friends into the biblical story. We want to be inviting our friends to consider the story, or the question they're asking, from the perspective of the biblical story. A question that can sometimes look quite daunting when you first hear it, sometimes when you then walk to the foot of the cross and look at it from there, can look quite different. So we want to bring the Bible into the conversation. Uh, fourthly and penultimately, we want to retell the gospel story through the question. We don't just want to give intellectual answers to people's questions. We want to, uh, we want to point people to Jesus. We want our friends to see Jesus more clearly. And I think we can do that with any tough question. So we need to be conscious of making sure that we do that, that we don't leave people walking away thinking, my, my word, my Christian friend is so wise. Uh, we want people to walk away thinking, gosh, Jesus is uh, so wonderful and so compelling. And then lastly, E is for equip your friend. If your friend has asked you a, a tough question, it's unlikely in a short conversation you'll be able to answer it entirely um, or satisfy them completely. But hey, if you can get to a place where you can say, you know, I hope some of what I've shared has been helpful. Look, here's a book you might enjoy reading or a podcast you might want to listen to or a YouTube video you might want to watch. That will help you go deeper. Try and look for a way to leave your friend with something they can then take away and go further. So those are the five steps that I always work through, try to work through when I'm faced with a question from a friend, a neighbor, or so on. Um, and as I say, the SHARE acronym hopefully makes that, uh, that easy to remember. But look, what does that look like in practice, I, I hear you cry? Well, or I would if you were a more interactive audience. What does that look like in practice? Well, that's a great question. I love questions. Thank you for that question. Um, let's take a look. And let's start with perhaps one of the, mes <coughs> excuse me, the most common questions of all. If God exists. Why is there pain and suffering? You know, that is probably one of the top five questions that I hear as someone who regularly engages uh, with, somebody, with, uh, with, the, with the secular world, with non-Christians. And it comes in, in various forms. But the gist of it is how can you be a Christian given the messy, broken world that we live in? Sometimes the question takes a more personal form too. Maybe somebody might say to you, you know, how on earth can you believe in God? You know, my, my grandmother's just died of cancer. What does, that, what does that look like? You know, if there's a good God, why did that instance of suffering uh, happen? If God is good, you know, why is Ukraine and Vladimir Putin carrying on and all this kind of stuff? So, however the question comes, pain and suffering, suffering and evil, how might we begin to engage with that question using the share method that I just introduced you to. Well, let's take a look and let's start with the first step of share. How might we begin? Well, the best place to begin is with S for sympathize. I will always, if somebody asks me a question about suffering, conscious there may well be a pastoral angle to it, begin by thanking them for their, for their question. Um, if they've mentioned a personal example of pain or suffering, uh, give them space to talk about that a bit more. If they've talked about a loved one dying, for example, great opportunity to sympathize and say, I'm so sorry, that must have been terrible, and let them talk about that a little bit. I will then also make the personal 
connection. You know, I will often add this is a question that I've thought and wrestled with uh, over the years. If it's appropriate, I will share examples of how you know, my family or I have, uh, have been through suffering and have experienced it. Um, I remember a family, very good family friend of ours was on his way home from work about 20 years ago and was violently mugged, att- attacked on the street uh, by three guys who beat him up, stole his wallet, and left him with life-changing injuries since when Anthony has never worked again. Um, I remember when that first happened, that was one of my first personal examples of suffering that caused me to ask huge questions. God, how can that happen? Um, or if it's personal uh, loss or bereavement, um, I will often talk about the experience that my wife and I went through when we had a, had a series of miscarriages uh, a few years ago and really wrestled personally with suffering and evil. So on this question, look for that opportunity to make that personal connection, to sympathize uh, with the sufferer, uh, with the question asker, because that will make what you say next be even more powerful. Well, then we come to hidden assumptions. What are the the hidden assumptions behind this question? Well, I think one of the hidden assumptions behind this question is the assumption that it's only Christians who have to wrestle with the problem of suffering and evil. Actually, everybody has to wrestle with the problem of suffering and evil. It raises questions for everybody. And one of the questions it raises, if you are an atheist, it raises questions like, why is it that evil and injustice and pain and suffering, why do they seem so wrong? You know, if human beings are just another animal, if we are nothing more than a collection of atoms and particles and molecules, why does it matter what on earth happens to them. Furthermore, if evolution is the only game in town, then in that kind of world, the fit are going to survive, the weak are going to get trampled on, and there is going to be pain. It's just part of the fact of life. Yet all of us as human beings, instinctively, when pain and suffering or evil and violence strike, we don't respond. Even the most hardcore atheist that I've met doesn't respond by going, well, that's just nature functioning normally. All of us naturally ask the why question. And of course, once we start throwing labels like good and evil uh, around, what do we mean by those labels? In a godless universe, who gets to decide? After all, in a godless universe, isn't it, isn't it just personal preference what we decide is good and what we decide as evil? And I wonder whether actually our atheist friends have more questions to answer here. Christianity certainly has some questions But I always want to say to people, I think actually Christianity gives us a far better framework for thinking about evil and suffering and injustice than does atheism. In fact, the very famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis uh, once remarked that he reflected on that when he was an atheist, actually the problem of suffering gave him huge difficulty. Um, he wrote, he, he later wrote, my argument against God back in his atheist days, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of cruel and unjust? A man does not call the line crooked unless he first has some idea of a straight line. So that's the hidden assumption behind this question. Well, next up, how might we apply the Bible into all of this. Well, I always want to look for the opportunity to say to my friends, you know, one of the things that I find so helpful about Christianity is that the Bible is profoundly honest when it comes to evil and suffering. In the very first pages of the Bible, it talks about the fact that evil and suffering is in the world, but evil and suffering is not the way that God intended it. Evil and suffering is a, is a cancer, an alien intrusion into God's good creation caused as human beings rebelled, tried to throw God out of the picture and make ourselves the center of the story. But the Bible is also clear that evil and suffering and pain will not have the last word because the Bible tells that much bigger story of God's plan to rescue and restore and renew his creation and do do away with evil once and for all. And I'll often say to people, I think that why we have in response to evil, why did this happen? is actually the instinctive reaction coming out of the fact that we know in the very fiber of our being that evil and suffering and death are actually not the way it's supposed to be. 
And that cry of why, that cry of protest, is actually our affirmation that the Bible story is true. Well, fourthly, we've sympathized, we've looked at the hidden assumptions, we've applied the Bible. How do we retell the gospel um, through the question of, of evil and suffering? Well, I'll often say to people, do you know, when it comes to evil and suffering and injustice, I think what most of us want is not something said about the problem. We don't want some kind of clever philosophy or clever theology. What we actually want is something done about evil and suffering. Evil and suffering and injustice and pain require something to be done. And that is why we admire people who dedicate their lives to fighting evil, fighting suffering, fighting injustice. We, get, we, we admire people who demonstrate compassion in the face of all that's gone wrong in the world. Now, compassion is the word I want to sneak into the conversation because compassion is a really interesting word. It's a virtue we admire in our culture, but it's a fascinating word. The word compassion is actually comprised of two Latin words, com, that means with, and passion, that means suffer. Compassion literally means to suffer alongside. Compassion means to be so involved in trying to alleviate the, the suffering of others that it has cost you personally, that trying to intervene and make a difference has actually cost you something. You haven't got detached, you've got involved. To do something about suffering in such a direct detail and with such involvement that you literally suffer yourself. Now, you can probably see where I'm going with this because things get very interesting here, don't they? Because at the heart of the Christian faith stands uh, our belief in a God who hasn't just said something about suffering, but a God who in the cross of Jesus Christ has done something about suffering and evil, disarming it and defeating it at Calvary. But that defeat of evil that we read about in the New Testament and see in Jesus came at a huge Christ. And we see in, uh, in Jesus, uh, we see a God of compassion, a God who not merely gives us the ability to name evil as evil, a God who doesn't merely just say something about evil, but a God who in Jesus has done something about evil, but at great cost to himself. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament, Romans 5 verse 8, which says, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And thus, as Christians, we have this tremendous hope uh, guaranteed in the death and resurrection of Jesus that one day evil will be gone forever. So we've sympathized, we've explored some hidden assumptions, we've applied the Bible a bit, we've retold the gospel story through the question. Lastly, we want to uh, equip our friends. There is so much more we might say, on evil and suffering. Uh, we've probably only scratched the surface. And perhaps on this topic more than any other, it's where it's good to be uh, aware of good resources that you can recommend to people, pass on and give to people. Uh, there are many, many great books and, and so forth out there, but three that I often recommend that's good to have on your list. Uh, Sharon Dirick's, uh, who's a good uh, friend of mine in Oxford, has written the brilliant book, Why? Looking at God and Personal Suffering. Uh, Amy or Ewing, a name may be known to, to some of us, very, very well-known speaker. Amy's book, Where is God in All the Suffering? And then uh, Jeremy Marshall, a uh, very uh, well-known UK writer, uh, Beyond the Big Sea, Hope in the Face of Death. Jeremy wrestled with cancer for many years and actually died just a few weeks uh, ago. Um, but all three of those books are written by authors who have experienced suffering, uh, yet have this tremendous hope. Uh, in Christ and the resurrection. They are wonderful books to give to people because they have that personal interest element because of the journey their authors have, uh, have been on. Great to have in your, uh, your repertoire to recommend to people. So that's our first worked example, the pain and suffering, evil and injustice question, how we use the share process in going through that. Let's just take one more uh, really easy, really simple, really straightforward question. What about all of the violence uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, how do we wrestle with, how do we deal with the fact that there are some pretty difficult passages in places in the Old Testament? I hear this objection a lot, especially perhaps from younger, uh, young adults. Sometimes you've come across some of the issues there. How can you believe in a God of love? I am asked sometimes when you read the Old Testament and uh, you can see God command genocide. You can command, God commands the Israelites to, to wipe out all the Canaanites. 
how one atheist friend put it to me even more bluntly. One atheist friend once said to me, come on, admit it. The God of the Bible has a split personality, love and compassion and kindness in the New Testament and violent wrath and judgment in the Old Testament. Why not just admit you Christians have two gods? They are utterly different. Wow, what a question. So how might we respond? Uh, More particularly, how might we use our share uh, method in trying to perhaps deal with this tough question and get into it a little bit? Well, let's start with S for sympathize. Whenever I get this question, I find it really helpful to, to put effort into connecting with the, uh, the questioner and recognizing they have a point. Um, I'll often say, do you know what? You raise a great question. I know when I was a younger Christian, when I read some of those Old Testament passages myself, there were many of them I read and went, oh, wow, that's, um, that's challenging. Uh, there are lots of passages in the Old Testament, not least in the book of Joshua, where, where I read them and I think, hmm, interesting, what is going on here? And if as Christians we haven't read some of those Old Testament passages and held them in tension with what we read about the love of God in Jesus and the commands to love your enemies and so forth, if we haven't at least raised the question in our minds what exactly is going on there, then maybe we haven't read carefully enough. So I always begin by acknowledging the questioner, acknowledging the questioner has a point and we need, to, we need as Christians to engage it. But at the same time, there are some hidden assumptions here, aren't there? There are some assumptions that our friend, when they've raised the issue of violence in the Old Testament, there are some assumptions that they're bringing into the conversation. See, one of the things I will often ask a friend if they raise this question, I'll look at my friend and say, tell me, have you ever wondered if there are situations where violence is permitted? And what might those situations be? You see... If they, are, uh, if they have thought anything about the world that we live in, it doesn't take, a, doesn't take a lot of reflection to say there are situations where sometimes it seems that violence is actually the right approach. Think, of, think back to World War II and the, uh, the action taken by the Allies uh, to deal with uh, Hitler and the Third Reich. Or we might look at what's going on with, uh, with Putin and Russia today, and many people might say, do you know what, maybe a military response is what's required. But if your friend is utterly committed to pacifism, if your friend is sitting there going, well, it, well it's never, ever okay, uh, then you might ask them, interesting, where does that value come from? Where is it you've derived the idea that love is the supreme value? Because again, if we live in a materialistic universe, if human beings are just atoms and particles, if natural selection is the only game in town, if the survival of the fittest comes at the expense of the weak, then... Who cares, quite frankly? Where have we derived the idea that love and compassion and pacifism are our our virtues? And I wonder whether, I wonder whether I'll say to my friends, the very fact that we read the Old Testament and we think, ouch, shows how deeply Jesus' values and ethics have seeped into our culture. And even the most committed secularist is actually far more Christian underneath than they have perhaps realized. So, we've looked at the hidden assumptions, we've sympathized. Step three, apply the Bible. Well, I would sometimes say to a friend who raises this question, I'll say, it's a brilliant question you've asked, but I wonder if you realize that the problem of God's love and God's judgment and how they fit together is actually raised by the Bible itself. We didn't have to wait until 20th and 21st century atheists came along and raised this objection. Um, The Bible itself, explores this tension. Scholars will tell you that one of the earliest books of the Old Testament to be written was the book of Joshua, was the book of Jonah. And in the book of Jonah, if you remember that story, there is a moment at the end in Jonah chapter 4 where Jonah has this massive whinge about God's character. God has just uh, forgiven uh, the uh, Syrians, the Ninevites. Uh, He hasn't rained down death and destruction and judgment on the city. And Jonah is not particularly happy about this. This would be to flirt with understatement. Jonah has this massive whinge at God. He says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
In other words, Jonah thinks that God, the Old Testament God, is too loving, too merciful, and too compassionate. Jonah was wrestling with how God's love and God's judgment fit together. He sees these things as contradictory, but I would suggest the Bible doesn't. Rather, the overall picture of the Bible is that God's judgment flows out of his love. The opposite of the word love is not the word judgment. The opposite of the word love is potentially the word apathy. I just don't care about somebody. If you love somebody, if you truly love another person, you will care deeply if they are wronged, hurt, wounded, or oppressed. And that, says the Bible, is one of the reasons that God acts in judgment. He loves the world that he has made, and he hates injustice, evil, and violence. And when he sees that, he will bring judgment. Coming back to the book of Joshua, we see something similar in play. When God commanded the Israelites uh, to drive out and destroy the Canaanites, they were not being asked to destroy a nation of vegan, kitten-hugging, pacifist, knitting enthusiasts. Rather, from what we know of Canaanite society, it was truly evil. One, for example, in which the worship of the god Molech uh, was rife. And in the worship of Molech, children were sacrificed. Babies were cast into the flames, burnt alive in the worship of that deity. But furthermore, when you read back in the Old Testament, nor does God rush to judgment. God says to Abraham in Genesis that he will grant the Canaanites 400 years and then the time will be ripe for judgment. And as I introduce those ideas into the conversation, what I'm trying to do is to help my friends see the wider picture. For in all of these things, context is crucial. Imagine that uh, you have never watched the original Star Wars movie. I find that hard to believe that anybody here could not have watched that amazing piece of pop culture, but maybe there are one or two of you here who have been, uh, who've missed out on this amazing experience. Um, imagine you've never watched the original Star Wars movie, and you walk into a room where a friend is playing it. And you come into the room right at the end of uh, that first Star Wars movie, and the very first thing you see on the screen is uh, the moment where Luke Skywalker fires his missile and he blows up the Death Star. What kind of horrific story is this, you protest to your friend? This is monstrous. That guy with a terrible haircut and the wooden delivery has just destroyed thousands of people. This is a genocidal, monstrous movie. What are you doing? Why are you watching it? Well, of course, you've missed the bigger picture, haven't you? You've missed all of what's come before. You've missed the evil empire, the destruction the Death Star has wrought as it's destroyed planets and innocent people. If you locate the act of judgment within the bigger story, the whole thing looks very, very different. Well, fourthly, retell the gospel. I will say to my friends, you know, as I read the Bible, I'm struck by the parallels that people are often not aware of between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, Your friend, if they're not a Christian, may not be aware that the Bible was written over 1,500 years of history. And there are some fascinating parallels between the Old Testament and the New. And one fascinating parallel is that in Hebrew, the name Joshua and the name Jesus are the same. And they have the same meaning, the Lord saves. So it's interesting, in both halves of the Bible, a guy with the same name goes to war against evil. Now, Joshua's war against evil was one that used the sword, and it used warfare, and it was a temporary victory. At the very best, Joshua's uh, victory pointed a sign to the fact there was a much bigger victory, the greater battle was to come. And in that much greater battle in the New Testament, Jesus wars against evil, not with the sword, but with self-sacrificial love. Jesus destroys evil once and for all by laying down power and allowing violence to do its worst to him. And even as he hung there on the cross, he publicly forgave his enemies who had nailed him there. And I'll often say to people, you know, talk of enemies is interesting. Talk of enemies is interesting because as we ask questions of the Bible, And as we look at it and we ask questions about it, and especially the Old Testament, it is very easy to sit in judgment on the Bible. 
It's very easy to, to sit there assuming that we are the good guys in all of this. But I'll often say to my friends, I wonder whether it struck you that as you read the Bible overall, it doesn't let us off the hook. The Bible points out we are not the good guys. All of us are God's enemies because we've turned our backs on him. But thankfully, the God of the Bible is demonstrated in Jesus to be a God who loves his enemies and who gave his life for his enemies and who offers, if we put our trust in him, to make us his enemies into his friends. Well, again, as with the suffering question, this is a massive question your friend has asked you about the Old Testament. Uh, and so it's great to recommend some resources they might read, take a look at, you might give to them so they can explore it in, uh, in more detail. And here are just a few that I found helpful uh, over the years. Uh, firstly, we have uh, the book The Skeletons in God's Closet uh, by Joshua Ryan Butler. That looks at a number of questions, actually. looks at the whole question of hell. Uh, it looks at judgment, and it looks at holy war in the Old Testament. does a really good job of engaging uh, with those questions. Then we have David Lamb's book, God Behaving Badly. I love the title. That's a brilliant title on that one. Is the God of the Old Testament angry, sexist, and racist? And again, David does a brilliant job of exploring that question and helping folks who don't have a faith uh, see why uh, the Bible makes sense on that topic. And then lastly, at Solas, the organization I work for, we have a video series called Short Answers. That's about 185-minute videos now. Every two weeks, we release a new one where we take a tough question about the Christian faith and we try and answer it in a super non-Christian friendly way. So you might want to give that a go. Well, in conclusion, with practice, you can use the share approach on almost any question about your faith. But just remember, it's not this rigorous set of steps that you have to mechanistically follow. It's a set of guidelines. It's a framework to help remind you to, to do these things, to sympathize, to connect, to explore the assumptions, and to point people towards Jesus. But as I end this first session, I also want to remind us that it's important as we engage with our friends and our colleagues to remember the goal. We are not trying to win arguments. We are not trying to show off uh, our intellectual chops or that we are somehow superior in our thinking to our friends, and we are certainly not laboring under the misconception that we can argue people into God's kingdom. You cannot argue people into faith. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So what are we doing in our conversations? Well, earlier I mentioned C.S. Lewis. And one of Lewis's great friends at Oxford University uh, was the Anglican minister, theologian, and pastor, um, Austin Farrer. And he put it very helpfully uh, in something he once said. Austin Farrer said, argument does not create conviction, but the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. And that's what we're doing when we're answering people's questions about faith, when we're engaged in what is often called apologetics, giving an answer and a reason for the hope that we have. We can't create faith by what we do, but I do believe that we can with wisdom and humility kindness, the power of prayer, and the Holy Spirit empowering us, maybe we can remove some of the obstacles that prevent people from seeing Jesus clearly.